Well, we are thrilled to be here. Uh, we own and operate a 10 year old business in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're uh, cheese heads. We love eating cheese. And uh, why don't we dive in? What do we want to talk about? How do you want to get this thing kicked off? I guess, well, we got to say the piece de resistance. First of all, it took me like two hours to set up, so I'm not ready to break it down That's yet. Fine. But, That's um, fine. Uh, how do we? How does one become cheap? The uh, cheesemonger. It's certainly not necessarily going to school at Georgetown, except that it, it did help us. It did help us a lot. Um, so we met our junior year. We were both. Um, I was working for uh, the Fork Students of Georgetown Incorporated. I was in grocery, so I was in Vital Vittles and Hoya Snapsa. And I was the chairman of the board, uh, newly elected when we first met in uh, at the end of the year in our senior year. And so we, we can't remember when our courtship began. But it was somewhere along that senior year, and then we know when we cemented it, which was during all of the finals right before Christmas um, of senior year. Yeah. And the rest is history. And so that's how we ended up here. You too could become a cheesemonger if you went to SFS or MSP. Just give us a call. We'll tell you how. It's Just awesome. not in Austin, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we fast forward years later. We're on our honeymoon in Grenada in the Caribbean, not Grenada, Spain. Um, so Grenada is an island, which for all the SFSers, you know it out there, but uh, it's an island that's 7 by 13 miles. Um, predominant food is seafood, not known for cheese, and I'm sitting there on the beach thinking about all the amazing decisions I have made in life, looking at this husband, listening to the, the waves crash against the beach shore, I can feel that hot sand in my toes, feel my drink perspiring, and I look over at you and you have like your perfect little pink colada. It was a and purple drink. It was awesome. Something purple, yes, for sure. And um, and I'm thinking, wow, I don't know what I did to get here, but I'm so grateful. And John, at that second, turns to me and says, I want to quit my job. And I was like, uh, okay, what are you going to do? And you said... Something and cheese. Something saw, and cheese. Yeah. yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I you know, had the perfect, uh, perfect wedding. We had a perfect house. We had perfect dogs. The only thing in my life that wasn't perfect was my job. And I, at the time I was a, well, I still am a CPA, Certified Public Accountant. I was working for Deloitte and & Touche and um, that type of work didn't suit me um, and uh, didn't play to my strengths, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point in the near future. And so I let Kendall know, I was like, you know, this was ever the time to go out on my own, to try something on my own, this was it. Right after our wedding, we didn't have kids yet, we didn't have huge responsibilities. And she fortunately said, all right. Yeah. Sounds good. So uh, we sat down, I mean, after like a two year stint of you writing your business plan and thinking about what we would do, we finally put it all together and said, what are we best at? Well, clearly they say you're good at, whatever you're good at is what you're best at. So we were like, well, we like to talk a lot. So clearly we're good at talking. We, we like love to eating. We're really good at eating. <laughs> so something that involves food. Um, we feel like we're our best selves when we're together, so how can we work together? And um, we eventually wanted to travel, but so what, what, how could we put all that together with the cheese concept? And it finally came to be that Austin doesn't have a cheese shop. And so we could be Austin's first cut to order cheese shop. So what does it mean to be cut to order? Um, it means that when you come into our shop, just like old school, is Baskin Robbins a Southern thing? You all have Baskin Robbins? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, John's from Nap Suffern, uh, Rockland County outside New York City, in New York. Um, you told me I'm not supposed to stay outside New York City. So, in New York. Uh, and I'm a Texas I girl. I would something that would be something. <laughs> Born and bred. Uh, well, now you've messed me up. What are we talking about? Where are we were from, Baskin Robbins. So. Oh, so when you come into our shop, what's it like? It's like you see a cheese case full of 100 cheeses just like you would see a lot of ice creams, and then you get to just sit there and pick and taste, and we want to walk you through it. So we're all about making cheese fun, approachable, playful, taking the pretension out of it. So uh, if you, all those rules you think you know, like no cheese and seafood, type them in there and let's bust those myths. The whole point is that food should be fun, it should be about community, it should be about coming together and just enjoying the Enjoying great yourself, enjoying the, the flavors that somebody took days, hours, months to create just for that particular second of time. By the way, that was a great bite. Uh, because we have so many screens, y'all, we can't see the names of all of you that are on the video uh, because we're not up in tight close to it, which is pretty much Zoom uh, protocol or best practices. So say hello in the chat window so we can see your names. I want to say hello to everybody and uh, be a part of y'all's experience just as much as I'm a part of Kendall's experience right now too. So. Yeah, so we've got our tea shop. Um, and not only has cheese, but it has a whole case of cured meats. Um, then we have beer and wine. We have a whole wall of pantry items. 
So honeys and nuts and olives and um, what else? Oh, jams, jams and chutneys. So the, our yeah. mission creep is anything that could go on a cheese board or with a cheese board. So we don't sell, like a lot of cheese shops will sell spaghetti and pasta and all that. For us, it's like, can you stick it on a board or eat it with a board and that, but we get pretty creative on that. So like chocolate bars, we put chocolate on boards and we're gonna do some of that today. Um, this is awesome, we got a bunch of people from Austin. Yay! What's up, Austinites? Hey, Scott from DC. Uh, Alex, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming out today and being a part of this. Hey, Steph Durbin. What's up, Steph? We miss you. How's Connecticut? We got awesome. engaged at Stephanie and Patrick Durbin's wedding, so thanks for being yeah. on with us. Also, clearly, fellow boyas. Um, oh, I just have to show you because I will forget. These are John's wedding boots when he came to Texas. Uh, my parents got them custom made Hoya Sacks awesome. wedding boots, so I just wanted to show you all those to you. With That's some like derogatory names. Not on the cheese plate though. Not on the cheese plate. <laughs> They're not eating it. Okay, so yes, you want to make cheeses, a uh, cheese board. I want to know from you how many of you are actually going to try to make a board with us versus you're just watching it because we can give you tips and tricks and we want to do that all along the way. We could talk about cheese for six hours straight without a breath. So that's not a concern. So just ask us some questions. Let us know. So just let us know what we're, uh, what we're here doing with it. So I thought the first thing we would talk about is flavor. Um, Shay's making a board. All right, Shay. Like. That's awesome. All right, Great. and Stephanie's making a board. Kelly, this is Martha, great, y'all. Martha, you're not attempting a board. At the end of the day, you're going to have, have something a board on a plate and, and you're you going to eat it. <laughs> That's the best part about making a board. You have to make it, then you have to spend an hour on Instagram pictures. Claire, and then you board. eat it. Yeah. Kathy, okay, so here's what's fun about when we do this today. You would think that I had set up a plan and I'm like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I got no clue what I'm going to do. So this is as if you were for real in our house and you came over and we're like, oh, crap, we're supposed to have served people food. And one of these people get out the cheese and put everything on the board. So that's what we're going to do for you today. But I did want to show you, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, like if you order from us a cheese tray, you're going to get this one. Uh, this is a small that we offer. And we do lots of different ones. But just remember, at the end of the day, if you don't want to make your own board, we are big proponents of supporting local. So seek out, if you can, your local cheese shop um, by supporting wherever you live locally in that local cheese shop, you're supporting folks like us. Um, a lot of times we do ship nationwide. That being said, I'm gonna say, where do you live? There might be somebody great doing something nearby and refer you to them as well. So um, flavor, getting back to flavor. Whenever we start a tasting, or any, because we know those of you, some of you are going to be nibbling while we're doing this. So, what is flavor, John? Flavor. So I'm going to do one while you're. You can do it. If you have something salty or nutty in front of you, this is what we do before every tasting because it helps you uh, frame the experience that we're about to have. Um, what we're going to do is pinch your nose like this. It's on the recording in front of you there. Put it in your mouth, start chewing. Pay attention to what's happening on your tongue. So, your tongue picks up salt sweet, sour, bitter, and umami flavors. And when you're like, oh yeah, I really know what this thing tastes like, unpinch your nose and oh. exhale out through your nose. So this retronasal activity brings the olfactory into play. And the olfactory is where the majority, if not all, of thousands and thousands and thousands of taste memories exist uh, in your brain. And that's the connection to it. And so when you bring taste plus aroma together, you get flavor. And flavor is really what we're trying to experience and what we're trying to put together here for uh, friends, for guests, for uh, business partners, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish with your board. Flavor is the ultimate expression of that. So now you know that your mouth can only taste five things. Sweet, salt, bitter, sour, and umami. Everything else that you know from food or from drink is all through that old factory. Um, but we want to make sure, the reason why some of you are building your kit, I said three to five cheeses, and then I said some dried fruits or some fresh fruits and then some pickled goods. And then if you do salamis or some crunchy nuts or something, why? Because those are gonna hit our sweet, salt, bitter, sour, and umami. So the whole goal when you're, for us, eating a cheese board isn't just about consumption. It's about the interactive experience of finding the perfect combo bite and changing it up. And when I pair this cheese with this vegetable versus this cheese with this pickle, how does it change the cheese? What happens on my palate? And it makes me just want to keep diving back for more. Yeah. Yeah. And we have two questions. One of which is I'm like, what are our questions? Is, John? A, is it better to have a wooden board or a glass board? Oh, good and question. Because we start with the foundation, right? Okay. So 
all programs. I'm going to say, I'm going to like blow your mind, especially with our like very structured education of bringing up. I don't care what knives you use. There's all the things like, oh my gosh, which knives am I supposed to use? I have my green knife somewhere. I don't know where it is. There are specific knives, but we don't even use them. Honestly, like my tools that are all set up here. Okay, this is a green knife. Is, this, this would be a green knife. You see the holes in it? We've never used it once. Okay, we used it once. Oh, we used it maybe twice. See how it's got holes? So we have it, but we don't use it. So our goal, what is it? We work about functionality. So I have some regular, like, steak knives we got for our wedding. Um, regular, just old school knives, knives is what we pull out. There are, you can buy your special knives kit. And sometimes I know you guys do that just because it's fun and you want to. And so you, there's like a parm knife and soft cheese knife and a blue cheese knife. That being said, our main goal is just have a different knife for each cheese out. Because if you cut with the same knife and share, you're gonna cross contaminate flavors. So just make sure you have a different knife out for each cheese. That being said, any knife. So to your point about the boards, we just have to have a lot of wood boards and like them. You can put it out on a glass board. Um, what else, what are other boards these, that these, have out The there? wood boards match our aesthetic in the shop, which is why we end up with them after they've finished being used in the shop. Glass, yeah. ceramic. The one thing to avoid is um, a paper, like a liner on a board that absorbs grease because when you have that, it can look unattractive after a few minutes. But uh, if it's a wax type of coating, a wax sheet like this has a wax sheet on the bottom that doesn't absorb fats. So that would still look attractive after eating. I think that's really the only piece uh, to avoid. Okay, the other thing I was gonna say though is if you have a glass board and you have a really hard cheese on there that you have to pre-cut, just think about how people have to interact. So again, whether it's for you or your guests, they're thinking about when I actually interact with this product, what am I gonna do? And what is the sound? What's gonna happen on the board? And if you have a glass plate and you have a really sharp knife and a really hard cheese, it's gonna, it can be challenging and you might get cracks in your glass plate. So just think those things through. But if I had that gorgeous glass plate I wanna use, I would just pre-cut that hard cheese down and so no guests are having to cut it. And heck, we're in a pandemic and we're only eating in our households anyway, so probably nobody else is touching your cheese and you can cut it down. And slate boards can do the same thing. I see a question from Scott. Slate boards can um, you know, fracture a little bit if you've got that really intense knife and that really intense cheese and your guests are just kind of going after it. So I'm something to consider, but I love slate and it's worth just replenish. I'm a big fan of the faux slate boards that are out. Um, so that's, yeah, something to think about the slate boards. We just happen to crack every single slate board we own. In fact, we sold them all the time and they would like crack from the customer getting it from the shelf to the POS station. So, um, slate boards are gorgeous. Why are they gorgeous? It's about that contrast. Cheese is usually bright white it's on that black and it, it stands out. So it's just the aesthetic that you're looking for. John, I think I better start getting some stuff on here. I think and so. And you're going to talk. This is amazing. All right. So. Um, there's two, uh, there's two types of boards that you can create. Um, there's what we consider sort of a freeform board that has a kind of a uh, river of product all mixed together. You're kind of incorporating fruits and veggies all mixed together, almost touching each other. Um, there's also what we do with our boards here, which is more like a color blocking structure where you're keeping these items independent from each other so that the flavors maybe don't interact as much. It really, again, depends on uh, who you're serving. If you know that everybody that you're serving loves all these flavors sort of mixed together, it can create a beautiful expression if you kind of just put it all together really close and tight. Um, when we're serving these, uh, uh, selling these, we're not sure who's going to eat them. So we'd like to keep, you know, olives away from uh, uh, like really acidic other foods. And uh, we like to put really delicate flavors next to more delicate cheeses like uh, the strawberries and the chef. So it's just one, uh, two different approaches to doing boards. And then also when you consider the board that you're using when you're about to plate, because with a board the size that Kendall has chosen, there's likely gonna be quite a bit of negative space. It depends on how much of this stuff she ends up going there, but creating negative space can actually be really attractive if you have this uh, big board and then if you have a smaller board, you can do the same. I think we might be able to get to show a second sort of cheese plate that we have over here that's more personal. But what Kendall's doing now. So I always start with the cheese. And afterwards, people are like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. How did you do that? And honestly, I just start putting stuff on 
Um, the first cheese board we ever did for our business was so ugly that went out and it's because we like fussed over it for two hours. So really the food should speak for itself and it's just getting it on there. I think something to note is so what I asked y'all to have if you're doing this or if you're just serving with people um, is three to five cheeses. Now we have people who say, I want 10 cheeses or this, that creates palate fatigue. You don't know what you're tasting at the end. And our goal is that you know this labor of love these people have made. The goal is that if a guest leaves your house or you're, if you're sitting there in bed thinking about that night, dang, that cheese plate was really good I've made. I want you to remember at least one new cheese maker or one new cheese that you've exposed yourself to. If you've got 10 cheeses, it's really hard to do that. So John and I really prefer three cheeses, but I did five today. And what I told y'all to have. Oh yeah, by the way, this is just for Kendall and I and the kids. So we are going all in. And for you, I wish y'all were here with us. You'd be so special. I know, I was like, neighbors can't even take our food right now because of the pandemic. So what I told y'all to have is um, we want diversity and representation. And we've been doing a lot of those trainings. Yeah, we want representation. Representation, not on diversity. Board. They're all different. So I chose a soft goat's milk cheese. Um, I chose, I told you guys to do like a soft goat, a hard cow, which would be my cheddar. This is Flory's truckle from uh, Missouri. Um, and then a sheet milk blue. Instead, what I've done today, because this is kind of a classic board, I've got a young goat's milk cheese. I have a manchego style from Spain, so that's a firm sheet milk cheese. I have um, Flory's truckle, a cheddar. I have an aged Gouda, so this is my hard cheese over here, and then I have blue cheese. This is Caveman um, from Rogue Creamery in Oregon. Uh, and this is Lemus Gouda out of Holland. So those are my five base flavors, and then I'm gonna start filling in around it. I am gonna put some charcuterie straight on the board. If you don't do cured meats, then clearly skip that part. Um, but I just try to get the proteins on board first, and then I fill in with all the flat. Um, did you talk about color blocking? I did. And, and I was, I was you were it. So okay. uh, there are four main milk types that you can likely source um, for your cheese board. So in the, in the United States, what's typical, cow, goat, and sheep. And so you definitely want to have, and I would recommend, recommend, unless you know one of your guests doesn't like one of those flavors, uh, typically that would be a goat's milk cheese that somebody doesn't like. Um, I would typically have one of each of those flavors. Uh, goat's milk is very acidic, uh, which is really nice and palate cleansing when you're enjoying. And goat's milk cheeses can come in these very soft young ones like these two here, or in the aged cheeses. You can have a very aged, dry, hard as rock goat's milk cheese. They'll all present slightly different looking, but that acidity is really nice. Cow's milk is the most buttery. It has the most sort of uh, uh, band uh, flavor profiles that you can access. And so uh, you can get a cow's uh, cow milk cheese that's really young and fresh, just tastes like butter. And you can get some that are old and go more towards like uh, leather notes or um, onion and grass and things like that. The milk is really versatile like that. Um, and then sheep's milk is the richest of the milks. And so you definitely always should aim for having one sheep milk because typically, as we have seen in our shop, that becomes the crowd favorite, the most sort of popular flavor profile um, is typically sheep's milk, which is why a cheese like Manchego is so popular, uh, like Kendall said here in the middle. Um, and then one of the other little notes is if you're gonna serve under five people, three cheeses is more than enough. If you know that you really like them, go for it. Um, once you go to five, you definitely want to make sure you incorporate a blue cheese because not everybody loves blue, but somebody that you're going to serve over five, if you have more than five people is going to really like a blue cheese. I, I could, you could put less of it on the board. Uh, we have basically equal proportions here on this one today, but a blue cheese, you get a smaller amount, you put it there. That's a, a pretty smart move when you're making a cheese plate. Typically you're going to see fewer people eating the blues. Um, and that's, you know, that's just, a, again, a personal preference that we've seen over the years. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I'd recommend. Then in our shop, do you want to talk or can I do the seven styles real? Um, I do want to do a pause about where I'm at and what I'm doing. Okay, so I put all my cheeses down. And if you'll see, I intentionally try to serve them in different kind of formats. So my soft cheese, um, this is gorgeous as it is. It has this geotrichum endodome rind, which we call the brainy rind. Hold it up. Can you see it, guys? Oh. Oh, so this is my favorite rind to eat. It's delicious. 
When we called the IT department in our house this morning and said we need to have two screens and we need to figure out how one is above, you got it was amazing. I got right to work and figured it out. It's like a it was, GoPro in like a vase sticking out. It's one of those little iPhone sticks. Oh yeah, it's way like, not cool to figure. It's so it. not cool. We shouldn't talk about it. Okay. The IT department. All right, so I have this beautiful little cheese. I want to leave it whole and not cut it down so people can see it and interact with it. But I have cut one piece out so visually you can see what it looks like and what that tells other people is how to then keep cutting it. Um, one of the saddest things on a cheese board is when you walk up and people have like hollowed out a brie. A lot of times just because they don't know how they're supposed to cut it. So now you'll know because you're all going to be experts after this. You just cut the whole piece of cheese. You take it away. If you want to eat the rind, you eat it. If you don't, you don't. But you don't hollow it out. And so that does bring us to, to eat the rind or not. And we always say... A rind is a terrible thing to waste. No rind left behind. The puns could go on all day. All be kind to your rind. But you paid for it and it's part of the experience. So try it, taste it, always try it first. If you don't like it, stop eating it. Yeah. But most of the time you probably like eating it. So I tried to cut them all in different formats. I went ahead and chopped my manchego all the way up into wedges that can be easily grabbed, but you, I love leaving them whole, to be honest. My Gouda, I'm doing more in this matchstick um, format. I think what you will see is that I have refused personally, it's not that I'm too good for it, but I've refused to put any cubes on this plate. So far, in life. Um, and that, it, we've never done a cube cheese in our life in the tea shop. And really that's because we want people to know what artisanal cheese is. And people are so used to seeing the ubiquitous like cheese cheddar cubes um, in grocery stores. And it was a labor of love. And cheese makers very intentionally made it into the shape that they have. All right, so I cut them all different ways. I cut this one. I want to leave it whole, this cheddar, but just to show how to keep slicing it. And why is it that I would slice it that way? Well, the goal is that everybody takes an equal piece of the rind. Why? Because it's going to taste different in the inside of the cheese to the outside. It's usually saltier in the outside, a little creamier in the inside. Um, this rind, you can eat and not eat. It won't matter. But that'll show people how to keep cutting it. And then I really prefer slices of blue, but I'm having fun with it, and I'm trying to do this upside down, and I mutilated this blue cheese, and so now we're going to turn this into a beautiful Almost. blue cheese crumble area. Which folks are <laughs> used to, but you're going to want to provide a spoon rather than a knife for that particular cheese. Then if you'll see meat, um, salami, I just want to show you a different way to cut it. Um, instead of just doing medallions or um, slices, I actually did chunks of it, and then I cut it more into matchsticks as well. Um, so just creating different textures and maybe people get to interact with food in a different way. Mm -hmm. the, then lastly, my little, um, okay, we call these flesh flowers, but you're supposed to call it meat lace. So sorry, vegetarians, but I call it flesh flowers. If you take your prosciutto or your bigger format um, pieces of salami or whole muscle meat, you can just fold them in half and do this. And so it's just a fold, fold. And then a lot of people on their plates will make a river of it going through. Um, but you can even do a rosette of it and like pile it up almost what looks like a bouquet. Yeah, so those are just, now I'm gonna start while John is talking, going in with some pairings. Um, what do we have for pairings? We have specifically, we have fruit out here, we have pickled stuff, well, we have dried fruit and fresh fruit, which are gonna offer different flavor combinations and I'll let you and talk this about. is a great opportunity to ra raid your refrigerator. Right, like you have little bits of jars of things from, that you've been gathering over the course of the last two years. This is a great opportunity to just open up your fridge, pull some things out that you enjoy the flavor of, and then experience them alongside the cheeses. And so things like just carrots, uh, little cornichons, so pickles, sliced pickles. Uh, uh, these are pickled peppers that Kennel's grabbing, some dried figs. We have almonds. Chopped up peaches right now is Texas peach season, so we've got chopped peaches, uh, apple, peppers, a really vibrant array of things. And what that's doing, you can see on this small cheese tray that we have here, and I know one of our, our friends, John, put small question mark. Everything's bigger in Texas, John, so this is a small. Um, and so basically what we've done here uh, is we've created an opportunity to kind of experience different things. You're not putting that much of anything on the plate that it's a uh, and meal into itself. It's more of a grazing experience. Little bite here, little bite there. That's how Kendall and I like to eat. And so um, definitely just raid your cabinets. You'll have, you might have cans of, uh, cans of fish lying around. You might have you know, radishes, uh, lots of crackers, um, just whatever you can find that you like eating. 
Uh, we did have a question, Jessica, how you would cut a brie. Typically, brie-style cheeses are big round ones. Here is an example. This is a smaller version of uh, that style. But you would basically cut little triangles out of it in a circle, much like this guy here. Uh, and that gives a really nice presentation. You have people take sort of slivers of it. Um, but there are, there are what we consider seven styles of cheese uh, in our business. Oh, um, I have the menu you can show it's us. It's the way that we kind of talk about cheese. Uh, for, uh, well, the menu, uh, yeah, we can say it. You can hold it up there. They can see it. There you go. Oh, no. The seven seven styles, styles of cheese uh, here on the back. You've got fresh, so, uh, soft ripened, and, and I'll go through each one. So a fresh style cheese is a cheese like a goat's milk cheese. It's a really vibrant, bright white, something like you'd see here. Meant to be eaten quickly. It has no rind, so it's not intended to be preserved. So that's a fresh cheese. Mascarpone, ricotta, those are really good examples. Certainly put them on boards. They're beautiful. They're delicious, and they uh, serve a really great purpose. Um, and then you've got soft ripened cheeses, which would be your brie style. Uh, that you, uh, we were just talking about a second ago, or this little Geo Trickum. You know, get out of your way so you can reach. <laughs> uh, just don't drink my cider. Uh, this, like this Geo Trickum. So it's a soft, grinded cheese, and it's all typically bright white. And that white rind uh, is mold. Uh, so it's a like pres preservation technique to use that mold to allow the milk to age a little bit longer. So you might be able to get, depending on the size and shape of the wheel, 60, 70 days. Here in the United States, we can't sell a raw milk cheese under 60 days. So if you can create a cheese that, like this that is larger, uh, that can age for a longer period of time, you might be able to sell it as a raw milk version, which is kind of nice. Uh, other countries around the world don't have that problem. Uh, we are one of the special ones. Um, and then we have uh, Wastrons, which is the stinky cheese category. So typically, we um, don't, uh, there are a couple cheeses in that category. They're soft and fudgy, creamy, uh, but they have this brilliant orange rind on the outside that's tacky and wet. This, they look like a brie, except for that rind. And that rind is a good indication that it's gonna smell like sweaty gym socks. And so, unless you know the, the friends or family or uh, people that you're eating with, we typically don't wanna put one of those stinky ones on the plate. However, for Kendall and I and the kids, we love that style of cheese, so we'll often incorporate a, a really stinky cheese on the board because it's something that we are passionate about and we love. And uh, uh, so just something to keep in mind when you're going shopping at a grocery store and you have 100 options in front of you, uh, look out for that orange rind. Okay, so some notes I wanted to tap in on. Um, when I put grapes on, I, we like to leave them a little bit rustic, again, so they're still like an, in, an interactive experience. Um, so don't pick them all off. Instead, put them on on the stems, but chop it down so a guest can, or you can just pick up one little section of stems and pull it off. As John talked about down here, I'm doing a little bit of color blocking. Also try to choose like um, marrying sweet with salt. I need to talk about flavor oh, combinations. Yeah, so good. sweet um, sweet and salt, sweet and salt, and some of the things I'm bringing out. Um, what else did I want to add in? Oh, you can jump, jump back in while I keep going out. That sounds perfect. You keep going. It's looking amazing. I was looking up the whole time. I didn't even get to notice. Um, and so uh, the next few categories of cheese are semi-soft, firm, and hard. These are all textural clues. And so texture actually gives you a really great indication of what you might expect from a flavor. Um, the longer these cheeses age, um, the more time the proteins have to break down into the amino acids, which are a direct correlation to the sort of depth of flavor that you might experience. So semi-soft cheeses are typically your great melters. They have a really good flavor profile. Uh, they're milky, um, typically, right? Uh, and maybe not uh, dark and intense, but milky and grassy. Um, and then as the cheeses age out more and they get drier and firmer to the touch, uh, harder to bend and less pliable, those amino acids are gonna give you a lot more nuance to them. And so, Typically, I like to have a semi-soft because they typically are most crowd-friendly. So like American cheese uh, in the block form, uh, or American cheddar in the block form, or Colby, Monterey, Oso Irati. If you've never had a chance to try Oso Irati, it's a semi-soft sheep smoked cheese. It's our shop's most popular since we opened. Um, and so we know that uh, customers are gonna fall in love with it if we put it on one of the cheese plates. 
Um, and then uh, we have uh, uh, the hard cheeses. You might want to uh, maybe not incorporate a hard cheese. Again, on a five cheese board, um, you might not want to incorporate that washed rind or one of the hard cheeses because, again, thinking about one of your guests trying to drive a knife into it might be a little awkward for them. And then, um, and then the last uh, one is blue cheese. So blue cheese is mold and um, uh, mold driven cheese. It's an aerobic mold, so it's, uh, uh, mold grows from the inside out. You can see here, see these lines that are coming down? Those are striations. This is where a cheese maker, after a short period of time, after the wheels are formed, will take needles and pierce the wheels of cheese, and that allows the mold on the inside to get access to this oxygen, and then it starts to uh, blue and grow. So it's an intense flavor. If you don't love blue cheese yet, I encourage you, try a lot more. And look for ones that have less bluing. Uh, if it has more bluing, it's going to taste more like the mold. If it has less, it's going to taste a little bit more like the milk type. And so definitely keep trying until you find one. There's no reason to not love blue. There's thousands of blue cheeses that you should try. Um, so, uh, so it says here, uh, some of the accompaniments are hard to identify. So yes, I'm gonna talk you through Kendall's going to do done. That was the seven styles of cheese in two and a half minutes. Okay, We've so better, dude. if you, as you're at home, like, what in the heck did she just put all over that board? Okay, so we honestly have fun, and we will be pulling out and putting together a board. And like John said, there's like everybody got some ubiquitous like jam in like a Christmas gift like six years ago, and you're wondering what to do with it. This is the time to pull it out. Um, you do not need, though, this smorgasbord of flavor combinations. I am just doing this for fun with you. Also, it is truly how John and I just kind of personally eat because I like to go for one thing and then another. I like to go sweet and then I go salty and then I go to something else and work my way around. Um, some of the questions we got and just to talk you through it, it's fun to mix up height in different ways. So sometimes I keep it in a bowl or this could easily just be poured out and it doesn't matter. Um, these are dried figs. It's also fun to eat them texturally and see them different ways. Um, and so I cut them in half. Um, you could also cut them all in half. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, over here, this is just a fresh chev that is inside these peaches. It's actually a locally made chev. Oh, you can't see it. There you go. It's a locally made chev um, that has peach and chipotle in it. Um, and so these are just some little composed bites. Um, and again, you're like, what? On the cheese board? I have bell peppers. I have carrots. Um, these are red pepadus um, from Africa. They were discovered in the 90s and they are Super cool. pickled. This is one of my favorite condiments ever. It's a chipoline, a balsamic chipoline onion. Cornichon pickles, I have honeycomb. I would put that right on. I just couldn't open it for you. These are leftover vegetables from the kids' <laughs> lunch yesterday. So why not, right? Like, awesome. If you're like, there's one piece of cauliflower, you're right, there is. There That's was one, piece, I have of one piece of cauliflower left. Some plums, apples, grapes. Um, so really, this, as it is, is 100% a complete meal. You have um, nutrients, um, vitamins, minerals, you have proteins, you have fats. Um, this with water, and as long as you've got your greens on the board, is actually a complete and healthy diet. Um, these are chocolate-covered Marcona almonds. Oh, uh, cashews, cashews, I'm sorry. These are Marcona almonds. And then my favorite thing to do, I have a sweet jam on here, which is cherry and white tea. But I also have a savory jam. So savory jams are my jam, y'all. Um, I have an apple onion at the house or shopping or liquory, and this is a sweet and tangy mustard seeds. I love mustard seeds. And these bowl. little, yeah, the little bowls can play really well. And one of the things that you could do, I see Matthew asked a question about, is there room for mozzarella or burrata? Uh, those are fresh cheeses. There's always room for those. The burrata, because it's so milky and wet, you might want to put it into a bowl like this guy here so that it can live in its own world and not impact the things around it. And the other thing that Kendall could have done here, uh, but we uh, chose not to, was put a- <laughs> Tell me, John, what could I have done If here? you want to spotlight a particular pairing, you could yes. actually, on a board of this size, you could actually, I don't know, put a smaller board on top of it to spotlight a, a one particular pairing. So let's say this cheese here, which is one best in the country, this is Harbison. Um, it's um, an example of a single cheese plate. You could just have this with radishes and maybe a couple carrots if we had some. In fact, we, we often, let me show you, let's just do it. Let's, let's just do, do it. it for them, honey. We often, grab 
Grab those radishes. Yeah, you got it. We'll eat this as just a meal of our family. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mess it We're up. We're gonna mess up the main one to show you a secondary. And this actually, if we wanted to, become its own cheese plate or just a spotlight on this main board here and just could live amongst these other things. And if you had the barata, you could um, you could just put the barata there with like olive oil next to it or, uh, or fresh baguette if you wanted to spotlight those two. And, and that's telling your guests, hey, these are the things that I think go really great together. And I think that's an important note um, when you're making boards. Uh, somebody asked about crackers or side bread. Yeah, like 72 options of crackers. They probably the can't see them, but we do have four crackers here and a baguette. And we did put um, some on the board for it, just as a, as a snack. And so typically we would keep this uh, side board you know, like there's, you can never have too many boards. So if we're recapping, because we're all over the place, because that's the way we do it. Cheese first. If you do meat, then do meat. Then add in your vegetables, your um, fruits, and your pickled goods. And then go back in um, and you can nestle any jams. Um, and then, honeys. Then I put in any sweet stuff, like the chocolates. And last but not least, and I did it out of order, but if you go in and put your nuts last, um, or your crunchy bits, that can help kind of fill it up if you want. And then I do usually do crackers last. So wherever I see like, oops, I have a big area open, I'll just move, can you give me part of the baguette? I will just tear, we are fans of tearing baguettes. It just feels, I don't know, more authentic. Um, and we will just use that in, if we're trying to make it more visually stunning, and then, in fact, when people start coming over, again, pre-pandemic, um, you can slice it. Pre-pandemic, yeah. Um, but if this is just for you and the family, we are huge fans of chunks of bread as well. Um, and then John is just doing the finishing piece of making sure that every cheese has a knife by it. Again, so this is like the smorgasbord. Another fun way, if you have a huge board to do this, would be to do one cheese with a pairing. Yep. One cheese, and you could on this exact board just put a cheese at the top, one, two, three, four, five, and then three different pairings down or one different pairing down. The whole goal though is what is on your plate right now that is sweet? What is on your plate that is salty? And the cheese is gonna take care of the salty. Really only aged cheeses are gonna take care of that salty or blue. What on your sweet has, what on your board has um, umami? Umami is what you get when you eat mushrooms or yeah, soy um, sauce. Is a great example. So for me, John, what do you think is umami on our board right now? So we have the nuts would certainly be these dried figs have a little bit of umami. I um, think onions the, do. The meat will have that umami, and so you've got some of those representations. Uh, bitterness is always an interesting thing to play with. Some of the fruits, like our uh, veggies, might have bitterness, like the pepper uh, might have a bitter component, which is fun to play with cheese. Um, and so, uh, whatever what, do we do them all? And then sour. sour. Well, sour. And you get yeah, that sometimes in the pickled goods. Pickled goods often, that vinegar bite, pepper. And, uh, and so, the, those are fun things. And basically, what you're just trying to do is create an opportunity for guests to have these flavor experiences that they might not otherwise get. And that's really, at the end of the day, what the board, besides the Instagram photos that you take for the like 20 minutes afterwards, it's that that experience of just kind of sharing food together and talking about it um, is what brings people together. And we always, in our classes, it's which is your favorite combo? What did you like best? So for me, I would love this with this honey, but what did you like? And creating conversation around the dinner table again. And it's super fun. We've had a six and seven year old. It's fun and interactive with our kids. They'll try everything once um, and helping them or letting them try to choose their own adventure has also been really fun. Um, do you so, want to read some of the well, we're coming off. We're coming towards the end. We're gonna probably stick around for a few more minutes. Uh, those of you that have to get off right for a forty-five or a, a forty-five minute presentation. Yeah. Those of you that have to get off, thank you for being a part of this experience with us. It's an absolute blast to get to hang out with Hoyas. Um, it's just an amazing experience. Y'all are awesome, and thank you for letting us um, be a part of it. Um, we are grateful to get to talk cheese. Uh, we have one question right before we do our closeout, but you go, what do you got? Oh yeah, okay, so we're gonna close out with the question, and I just wanna talk uh, lastly about your drink pairings. Bubbles, bubbles always go, whether you drink alcohol or not. 
sparkling wines, so that's your champagne, cava, proseccos, or sparkling waters. John and I, almost for every tasting, just have a sparkling water. So for us, it's Rambler, it's a local Austin company. Topo Chico is great. Um, why? Because it's a palate cleanser. And so cheese is salty and creamy and heavy. Are you gonna eat chocolate while we're talking? And you want to cleanse your palate? Sparkling is the best way to go. Again, whether it's alcoholic or not. That it also includes beer and ciders, which we have a cider out. Um, when you're doing your pairings, generally think the younger it is, the better it goes with the lighter, like whiter wine. Um, and the more aged it is, the more it could take on red wines. So there's a lot of gray area in there to play with. Ultimately, drink what you like and have fun with it. Um, and I hope that's the goal that you've learned for all of this, is that we truly think eating cheese should just be fun. Um, and so we like pulling everything out and making it a fun, interactive experience. What's the question we have? We have two. Okay. Should we eat uh, hard cheeses with crackers or bread? That is totally a personal choice. Um, oftentimes I use a hard cheese like it is a piece of bread and spread stuff on top of it. And so it's just however you want to eat it. So there's no right or wrong way to enjoy also, it. Also, I will always say out of the labor of love that is our cheese makers is taste the cheese naked first. I'm from the South, so I can say naked. How do you say for real? Neck naked? Anyway, taste the cheese in the buff. Why? Because I want you to get to know that cheese. If you immediately put it on bread, you're going to taste bread. So taste it first alone, and then taste it with crackers or bread or whatever you want. I am a little bit weird. I actually, it's not a carb thing. I just don't like crackers. I like more room in my belly for cheese. So as John said, I will just smear everything on top of the cheese slice and eat it that way. Or like putting shed into your pepper and peppers, or mixing them all that way, or creating a little taco with your salami and smearing on it. Okay, what's our other um, question? Last question, um, what to do with fresh herbs? So fresh herbs are interesting. Uh, some people, uh, they are beautiful and they are attractive and they can be a really beautiful garnish. I would recommend having a purpose for them when you're putting them on board. Are they intended to be eaten with something? Are you going to want the guests to take that bit of rosemary and chew on it while they're eating one of the cheeses? And maybe that is the point. Maybe it's with a fresh chef and some honey and that would be a perfect pairing. Um, if, it, if, if it's for, uh, you know, again, for a picture, it'll look beautiful. Uh, but a piece of sage or basil, they should have a point, like basil with burrata. That could be a perfect. Um, so usually I haven't had any herbs. I think what John's saying is it can, well, I know what you're also, you're not saying it, you're going with it, is an herb can really overwhelm cheese. Um, so don't put it on there unless it really is like a bouquet and it's being pretty somewhere um, or with your fresh cheeses is where they normally live. So in a bowl with like a fresh uh, feta, which is a goat's or sheep's milk cheese, you could drizzle in olive oil and top up anything that's in your garden, rosemary, sage, oregano, basil, and put it on there and that would be a delicious dip. And in fact, that probably for me wouldn't even go on a cheese board, that would just be a dip on the side. Um, and as somebody else mentioned, the basil with burrata is classic. And to me, those cheeses I usually just do on the side as their own special like interactive experience. You want to okay. Core principles as we roll out. Yeah. So as Y'all, we thank you. As we take you home, I just wanted to thank you again for doing this, and for anybody who was able to give a donation. Super important that this goes to financial aid. None of us know what anything looks like um, in the future, and so anything we can help out, and those of us who have resources or who have privilege and who have power, anything we can do to pass that along and pave the path for others is um, awesome. So thank you for just joining us today in our madness from our house. I can't believe our kids didn't run in streaking um, or our dogs to be able to join us. And all of that goes to say that we are trying to very intentionally live our mission, which is to do good eat good. For us, that means that we source all of these goods. We know the makers of every single person represented here on this plate. Um, it means we source goods from makers who make their goods in a way that's great for the earth, their animals, their teams, delicious for us, and that when people support us, we get to do the same and take care of our team and get back to our community. And that's part of our do good, eat good cycle. Our core principles, number one. Uh, is be a juggernaut of awesome. And so what we believe is that it's not just good enough to be awesome, you need to be an overwhelming force. You need to bring positive energy into every interaction and, and, and be, make the change that you can in the world. We hope that we've been a positive force for you today. And just remember that you always have the power to make somebody's day brighter or not. And so that's our Be a Juggernaut of Awesome. Number two, passion with purpose. So passion with purpose. Passion is what gives you fuel. Purpose is what gives you direction. 
one of them on their own is not good enough. You need both together to get you where you want to go. Uh, three, family first in business. For us, that's however anybody defines their family, whether they're four-legged and running around their feet, um, biological children, chosen family. We know that we all go to work or work from home or trying to find work, but every day so that we can put a roof over our own heads, food in our bellies, and pay for our health care, and especially for those people and things and animals that we love. So that's our family first in business. Um, then it's uh, be true okay. to yourself and to others. Um, that means you get to show up in the skin you're in to our work every day, not having to bend to be a personality or something that you're not. It means that we are always authentically who we are, mistakes in all, um, and that that's being true to ourselves. And then last but not least, improve every day. Yeah, if you think we can do this better, let us know. We yeah. have not, but we like to interact and be touching all the screens. So this is a little bit more challenging when we're really far away from the cameras. Um, but to date, we have done guided tastings for over 6,000 people. Virtually. If since you are not March. in Austin, we also do now, we were first to market on doing a cheese class in a box. And we ship it, and now we've done for groups who are trying to get together and create community in states all at the same time. Um, John and I both deal or have dealt with depression in our past. We wish the term physical distancing was used instead of social distancing. So we think it's more important now than ever to be connected. And if we can connect through food, it's living our own personal mission to spread joy. So with that, let us know how we can improve this so we can be better every day. Um, and with that, I'm going to cheers and thank you. And then we got some eating to do. Cheers, y'all. Good eating. Thank you so much, Kendall and John. This was awesome. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We will be sending a recap email, which will include information about other upcoming exciting virtual experiences, but I don't think any of them will cap today's session. Um, as well as a quick feedback survey. And in addition, if you guys would like to learn anything more about 90 Days with Georgetown, please visit 90days.georgetown.edu. And if anyone made a, a cheese board as they were going today and you want to take a picture of it and email it to the GUA Summer Sessions email, feel free to do that. We would love to share it on social media or you can share it on social. I made my own. It does not look nearly as good as Kendall and John's, but it Hello, looks pretty good. Turn on microphones in your videos. Show us, y'all. Tag us. Oh, yeah, that awesome. Pretty good. Pretty good. You guys are good teachers. Well, thank you all so, so much. Yeah, and we need to see others, too. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Anybody who just has to sign off can, but we're looking it up. If you, if you made a cheese board, show us. We love it. Hashtag show us your cheese board. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that. Uh-oh, John is trying to see where everybody else's is. Shay just showed one, I think. I saw yeah, it. Shay's been beautiful. Oh. Stephanie, you said the kids are already it? eating Where it. The, the Durban cheese board is already consumed. Shay, <laughs> you're gorgeous. Stephanie, good job. Oh, there we go. Now I can see. Awesome. Way to go, y'all. Y'all are amazing. Yay. Yay, Alex. Awesome. You guys are great. Y'all are incredible. Okay, Thank Stephanie, you. Okay, back to you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We're going to close out the session, but we really, really appreciate all of you all and Hoya Saxa. Hoya Saxa, Hoya Saxa. how long has it been? It's been so long since last we met. Lay down forever, lay down. Lay down forever, lay down. Lay down forever, lay down. It goes old Georgetown. Straight for a touchdown. See how they gain. And